Now, Hustle has been <laughs> chosen for the big read. Crazy, right? You know what I mean? Like, man. And then you look at the list, and I'm like, man, it's wild. Wild. Like, if you would have told me, you would have sat back and been like, I don't know, man, when I was, like, hanging out with Meadowbrook Apartments with some, some of my homies from Skyline, and if they would have been like, you know, in 25 years, you're going to be a poet, and your book, the first book you write, is going to be a NEA big read, you know, with the possibility to have a large readership, and you'll be like nationally recognized by people. I would have said, no way. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I would have never, never believed that that was possible. Mm -mm. Like I said, you know, and partly I've had to believe in myself sometimes beyond reality. <laughs> beyond the facts but i still would never have fathomed that if i would have been able to like eke out any little thing and just been able to just write a book i would have been happy but to be an nea big read is phenomenal it's something that surpasses my wildest dreams and it's crazy it's still crazy to me like i still smile like even you, you saying that i was like i know right it's a big read <laughs> That is the exuberant voice of poet and recently named Big Read author, David Tomas Martinez. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. David Tomas Martinez is a poet of great linguistic flair. He's fluent in Spanish and English, certainly, but he's also equally adept at moving from modernist imagery to the language of Southern California streets a Latinx slang mixed with hip-hop rhythms. David was born in San Diego to a working-class family, and he ran with a gang, but he found his way to college, becoming a poet along the way. He's now won multiple fellowships and awards, including the 2015 Verlaine Poetry Prize and a 2017 NEA Creative Writing Fellowship. And as you heard, his first collection of poetry, Hustle, has just been named to the NEA's national reading initiative, The Big Read. David Tomas Martinez is a self-identified code switcher, and his poems reflect this kaleidoscopic existence. He writes with great heart about life on the tough side of town, interrogating masculinity, power, and violence. His work is psychologically rich, knowing, and furious, all stitched together with powerful and playful language that reflects not just verbal dexterity, but a deep, passionate love of words. I remember being a small child and either in school or amongst my family, people responding to like my ability to use language. And um, as a small child, I would write, like, I mean, everybody does, right? That's a sort of obligatory rite of passage to write poems to your mother. You know, nobody writes poems to dads, right? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, maybe they do. No, it's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you did in Hustle, but that's yes. beside the point. But when you're a kid. Yeah, <laughs> and those aren't the sort of, like, you know, and, you know, my mom was like, why are there no poems about me? And I was like, I don't think you want me to write those poems about you, mom. You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah, so, <laughs> it's always like, dad, you made me angry. <laughs> so I think those were the first. And then later on, I became really entranced with slang and um like that for me was the first way that i began to think of the flexibility of language and mm. really understand code switching uh because it was growing up in an urban environment a working class a very working class environment uh, neither of my parents are college educated it wasn't like my parents were the black sheep they were just pretty much that is quo for their family so there was English, there was Spanish, there was slang because we grew up in an urban and it was a very sort of mixed racially neighborhoods we always lived in. And so like it was a sort of amalgamation of cultures and languages and code switching. Hip hop was the first music that was really mine. So listening to slang, incorporating slang into my own language at a very young age, um, we're talking about elementary school here, you know what I mean? That's, I think, when I really fell in love 
with language. And then so when I went to college at 21, I was an older, I was a non-traditional student. At, um, I was fully entrenched in the sort of verbal dexterity of slang. And as I took poetry class, I just t sort of took a poetry workshop as a... Um, I don't know, man, I didn't have anything better to do on Tuesdays and Thursdays and was like, you know, this is an easy A. Let me go ahead and knock this out, you know what I mean, so I can get it, so I can play. I don't have to worry about anything. And I don't know, man, I just, I just dug it. To me, there is a huge correlation between the use of slang and poetic diction. And it's coming up with a sort of metaphor or simile that really hits uh, is very similar to me to like saying something cool. But when you were a kid, mm -hmm. were your parents storytellers? No, mm -mm. no, no, no. Like my dad was a landscaper and my mom worked in a doctor's office and she was a secretary. And so like um, they were just focused on on working man and just doing their deal, like just trying to get by day to day. Their idea of focus on the better life was not via stories or narratives. It was go to college, son, and then like, you know, what I mean, you'll have it easier life. You won't have to work as hard as, as we are. However, my grandmother, my dad's mom, she would read to me as a little kid. You know, I'm the, I was the first grandson and, you know, in a Mexican family. So, like, that's a sort of special place. And my dad's the oldest. So, oh, yeah. So, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like in a Chicano family, like that sort of thing. Oh, I know exactly what you yeah, mean. Yeah, that's like. My ex-husband is, is Turkish. Okay. and was the eldest son of an eldest son of an eldest son. Yeah, yeah, man. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me say I denounce that form of patriarchy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but there is a special place in there. Like, you know, like if my grandma was cooking fish and I didn't want fish, I'd be like, you know, Abuelita, like I want some papas. I don't want fish. Fish is gross. And she'd be like, okay, mijo, just wait till after and I'll, I'll cook you papas. And like, you know what I mean? Like I, I think I went through my whole childhood eating potatoes. But my grandmother, you know, she spent time and she would read to me and like, and I just like sit in her lap, man. And she would just read to me for extended stretches. So then how did you end up running with the gang? You come from a solid working class mm -hmm. family and your parents wanted you to go to college. Yeah, Do yeah. You, can you remember yeah. what flipped? You know, it was just around. Some of my friends, like you knew they didn't have much chance like th they didn't have a father present and I had a father present and you know many many of my friends didn't they just didn't have fathers present they were either in jail or uh, other reasons and you know and then like their mom was in a gang and their mom sold drugs and you just knew it was it was a hereditary thing like and they didn't really they didn't really see any other way and my parents were very much opposed to me like being in a gang my dad one time like you know, he came down on the block and I was hanging out and he came in his truck and er, skidded out. And I was like, get your ass in the car. I told you about hanging out with these thugs. And I was like, I looked around. I was, they're like, you better go with your, your dad, homie. So like while my family was very much opposed to it, I just like, I don't know, man, like I'm going to do my thing. Like I was very hard headed and obstinate. That was my idea of strength. I looked around and people weren't educated. People didn't have any power in my family, I felt, that's how I felt. Um, my dad took his like masculinity, his like, a sense of power like very, very, very seriously, but he also was in a sort of hierarchical structure. He didn't have a lot of power. And so it wasn't something that I aspired to be. I didn't aspire to be my parents. I wanted to be something else. Like some people grow up and they're like, my parents are super cool. I was not like, my parents are super cool. I was like, mm. I was like, hmm, what's near me that's cool? And like gangs were. I was just, I was attracted to the power. I was attracted to the money. You know, they were like the celebrities in our neighborhood. Why did you stop running with the gang? You know, I don't know, man. Just because like I was a father at 17 and then I was a father again. And then I went into the Navy and then I came back and then I went to Job Corps. You know, I had other stuff to do, man. And I just okay. stopped hanging out you organically grow out of it. It's like, you know, the same way you, you stop going to the club, you just all of a sudden you're like, eh, I don't really want to. Yeah. I don't, I don't feel like going to the bar. I mean, like that's how I got sober. I was like, man, I want to stop creating the same patterns and the same mistakes. So you went to college mm -hmm. and you took a poetry workshop because it was a gap in your schedule yeah. and it looked easy. Did something happen to you when you were in that workshop that clicked? I think that I've been fortunate in that my whole academic career, people have been pointing 
towards a direction and saying that I have a, a natural ability. I enjoyed reading and talking about it ever since I was a little kid. Like I read a lot as a kid and and even when I was in a gang, I tried to read Nietzsche and I would try to read all of these other things. For me, that was a, a way of obtaining strength. I was attracted to that. So when I was in college with poetry, it was the same thing, man. I just took it and like, it's not like the, the instructor gave me a lot of praise during the class, but when I was, when it was done, she was like, hey, you know, you, you have some talent at this. We should take a, a poetry workshop. And I was like, eh. I guess, man, uh, whatever, you know, thanks. Uh, I was very nonchalant about it. And then, again, there's a sort of gap in my schedule, and I was like, eh, that was an easy A, you know, maybe I'll take it again. And while I was at San Diego State, I, t I took Lubber Davis, and um, <laughs> the very first poem I turned in, it was a poem that you could read down the page or up the page, and it was called <laughs> This Way Sorry. Up. So it was a very... <laughs> A very postmodern poem. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I turned in this poem, and, you know, people were fumbling around. Because, like, obviously it wasn't very clear, and it wasn't very good. It was very abstract. But <laughs> I thought it was good, and I was like, oh, man, this is, you know, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, this is going to really uh, revolutionize this workshop's uh, aesthetic. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, like, somebody had said, hey, I think you can read it up and down down the page and up the page and oh man this, you know and people started saying getting a little excited about it and uh, Glover just sat there and you know he played offensive line at Fresno State and so like he was a sort of big dude you know and he said well after this poem does that one trick which is brilliant what does it do and I was pissed I was like you do not see the brilliance of this poem short-sighted <laughs> you know what i mean like the sort of arrogance of the youth right like you know what i mean no one's oh. th there's nobody as, as as dumb as somebody who's a little bit smart i was quiet about it but i was like stewing inside and um i kept going at it i kept going at it and he kept giving me sort of similar feedback and i just and i thought let me listen to this dude what he what he's been saying and things just clicked and I saw what he meant, and I understood his critiques. And it really opened up something for me. And it really recontextualized the very first poem that I turned in, the one that I thought was like amazing. And I thought, oh man, I never want to turn in a poem again or just write a poem that just does one thing and me be satisfied with that. I wanted it to be good. And that really sort of helped form my aesthetic, that little moment right there, man. It's a big moment, though, because it's learning that being clever yes. really isn't good enough. No. Clever is great. And boy, yeah. you can get a lot of points for clever, but exactly, it's like beer. It goes right through you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and well, there has to be some, some sort of stu substance, right? Like, it's like after the flashing lights, with the, after the bells and whistles, you know, what does it do? And so, like, that really began to, like, form my aesthetic. And huge, huge learning moment for me. And at the end of the class, the same thing happened. I'm leaving out. I didn't think the dude liked me. And he was like, hey, David, I'm teaching a forms class next semester. I want you to take it. You show some real potential. It was like, I just, like, was like, whatever. Again, schedule comes up. I have a hole in my schedule. And also, as, as, as a former mentor used to tell me, sometimes there's a upstairs working that you're not aware of. And I see now that, like, I think there was an upstairs whole nother floor working that I had no idea about. And, you know, I took that forms class. And next thing I know, I took his class every semester, every semester, every semester. And he was like, hey, man, when I was graduating and I was getting my bachelor's, he was like, you should get a, you should get a master's degree. And I was like, a a master's degree. I was like, what am I doing with a master's degree, man? You can do what I do. You know what I mean? I do what I love. I teach poetry. He was like, something that in would interest you? I was like, huh. I thought about it. I got everything in. And I know he helped push me through and get me in. You know, I've been very fortunate with the people that I've been able to study with and like some of some amazing minds. And, you know, they would continue to challenge me. I am so happy that they could see through my own immaturity and insecurities 
like I'm so appreciative of all of the knowledge that they shared with me and all of the time. Well, let's hear a poem from Hustle. Okay. How about the first poem on Palomar Mountain? On Palomar Mountain. The dark peoples with things. For keys, coins, pencils, and pens our pockets grieve. No street lights or signs. No liquor stores or bars. Only a lighter for a flashlight. And the same faced trees. Similar armed stones. And crooked bushes staring back at me. There is no path in the woods for a boy from the city. I would have set fire to get off this wilderness, but Palomar is no El Camino in an empty lot. The plastic dripping from the dash and the paint bubbling like a toad's throat. If mountains were old pieces of furniture, I would have lit the fabric and danced. If mountains were abandoned crack houses, I would have opened their meanings with flame. If that would have let the wind and trees lead my eyes or shown me the moon's tiptoe on the moss. As you affect my hand as we walk into the side of a Sunday night. There is something about that phrase of walk into the side of a Sunday night that I find so evocative. <laughs> What's your process for creating an image? Well, I, you know, I think that um, like I was fortunate in, in early on, like I said, Glover Davis, my, my first mentor, he was a neo-formalist and um, he really was taken by the images, very sparse, terse poems. And obviously, like already, I mean, I, I sort of meandered through a conversation. Uh, <laughs> so that wasn't <laughs> really like the, psychologically my cognitive process that didn't fit very well. But the ideas of high modernism, which he pushed, I've taken like my idea of the image from high modernism. That's one of the, the biggest things that I've taken from them. And then I think also that what I try to do is look at the things that are around me physically or in my reading and I try to get to to the center of them what is it actually trying to say and I think that as I've became become a better reader I've become a better writer I mean that's a cliche right but I think that's really true and like I remember writing this poem like Sandra Alcosser who was my second mentor she lives in San Diego and she also lives in Wyoming and and she she's very nature oriented and in her like political stances and uh, she would talk a lot about that sort of stuff and I really loved the way that she thought of poems and so much of what she the way she views poetry has stuck with me and I remember she told me she's like David be in all camps but none to be flexible and not to be so rigid and in your aesthetic values to pick and choose what you like from movements and poetry and she would talk about nature and talk about like Wyoming and such. This was a writing prompt in class and like this poem came out of that. She had been going on about some nature sort of poem and I think it was like a prompt about that and I was like man I have no idea like about nature. I was like I'm scared of like raccoons man. Possums are like <laughs> I'm like you know what I mean like I'm like uh uh I'm like uh, like I don't know I don't feel very comfortable in nature. Cause we didn't like we didn't go in nature we didn't go places man like you know what i mean we didn't go in, into the woods or anything like that we stayed in the city i mean i grew up in a city too mm -hmm. but not only that but when you grow up in a city especially if you're a girl you're told yeah. you do not go in places that are dark where there is no one right and then suddenly you're in a cabin in the middle of the <laughs> woods and it's dark and there's no one i mean really it doesn't feel very safe no no no, no. <laughs> yeah i didn't I can completely empathize with that experience. <laughs> <laughs> now, for a long time, you said you resisted exploring your own life as a subject for yeah, your poetry. Yeah. So what had you been writing and what changed your mind? You know, I was just sort of going about, I was like writing formal poems. Uh, I was writing in blank verse. I was writing sonnets. I was very insulated in um, my experience of poetry. I had no idea of the of the larger poetry world. I didn't know there really was one. I just thought like there was the canon, and everyone reads the canon, 
and then you write poems and then 40 years later hopefully they talk about you that's what i really thought of like the poetry world so i was writing these poems and sandra alcoster like sat me down and was like you know i'm very respectful of like language poetry and post and experimental work and what it's doing but she was like maybe you're excluding a huge part of your experience by writing these sort of poems and i was like what (laughs) (laughs) again again like you know it's another one of those big moments you know like sandra told me essentially like you know you should be writing about your background and you have a wealth of knowledge and like experimental work may may not be your strength i straight up told her i was like sandra but like you know i'm chicano like if i write about like chicano things like i'm gonna immediately be ghettoized like I know how what the deal is. Like you, can't, I know what the score is. Like you're not like, and that's not what I want to be. Again, I'm s- very fortunate that the people that I've worked with they're very patient. Like there's real truth t- to what I thought about. She also was like, you just have to be patient and you have to believe in the work. I was just like, you know what? I just had to trust who I am, and that like I can do it well. And I think though also when you know when Hustle was published in 2014. The poetry landscape was much different too. And there wasn't a lot of books about like an urban experience. That's not your prototypical poetry subject. It is not. (laughs) And neither is The Only Mexican, which is another poem I'd like you to read. Okay. This is funny because I wrote this poem when I was in Houston. And I would go back and I'd visit my family and I'd stay with my dad and they had all done a very Chicano thing, and they moved in together to uh, take care of my grandfather, who was confined to a wheelchair and um, had dementia, and the poem comes from that. The only Mexican. The only Mexican that ever was Mexican fought in the revolution and drank nightly, and like all machos, crawled into work Crudo, letting his breath twirl, then clap and sing before sandpaper juiced the metal. The only Mexican to never sit in a Catholic pew was born on Halloween and ate his lunch wrapped in foil against the fence with uh, the other Mexicans. They fixed old fords where my grandfather worked for years. Him and the welder Juan wagered each year on who would return first to the Yucatan. Neither did. When my aunts leave, my dad paces the living room and then rests like a jaguar who once drank rain off the leaves of Sacopia trees, but now caged bends his paw on a speaker to watch crowds pass. He asked me to watch Grandpa, which means for the day. In town for two weeks, I have tried my best to avoid this. Many times he will swear, and many times Grandpa will ask to get in and out of bed. Want a sweater? He will ask the time. He will use the toilet. Frequently ask for beer. About dinner, when the Padres play. Por qué no novelas? About bed. He will ask about his house, Grandma, to sit outside. He will question while answering. He will smirk. He will invent languages while tucked in bed. He will bump the table, tap the couch. He will lose his slipper, wedging it in the wheel of his chair. Like a small child trapped in a well, everyone will care. He will cry without tears, a broken carburetor of sobs. When I speak Spanish, he shakes his head and reminds me he is the only Mexican. That, I think, is an extraordinary poem for so many reasons. Um, The imagery, certainly, a broken carburetor of sobs is really very fabulous, but the detail and the specificity, and yet... It, it speaks both to your background, but there's such a universality to it at the same time. Thank you. You know, it's funny. It's like I, I always wanted to write a poem with my grandfather. He would die sh- shortly after me writing this, but um, it's like an interesting figure to me. And he didn't speak English. And my grandmother had 10 kids, and they didn't speak Spanish growing up. 
in the home because she wanted uh, her children to assimilate into American culture. Now, my grandfather wasn't a citizen, and he be, I think he became a citizen <clears throat> much later on in his life. But my grandmother was from L.A., and she was Mexican and Yaqui. So she had a very different experience, Mexican experience, than my grandfather who had the diaspora. So, like, there was this very strange push-pull about Mexicanness and Latinidad. So my grandfather was very big about, like, I'm the only Mexican. Like, somebody in the family would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're Mexican. And my grandfather would be like, you're not Mexican. I'm Mexican. That's what he would say. You know what I mean? He'd be like, you guys are Americans. Uh, and then he would grumble and blah, 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 you know, like that. And, and, you know, and he used to like to drink. And so, like, it, it'd be sort of exasperated. And, like, he was also, like, you know, he could be a caring dude and very loving dude. But at the same time, though, like, I seen him chase every one of my aunts and uncles with a machete inevitably like we'd have a party and like they'd all get drunk and then like there'd be like some sort of argument so sometime in my life i've seen all of them and i'm talking about the boys and and, and the girls like it didn't matter and then like everyone would calm down and be cool and stuff like that and they'd be fine but like he was a very interesting figure to me and like so like i wanted to write this and i also wanted to sort of honor my dad and but also the distance of language here, too. And I was really fixated on language and, and that sort of thing at the same time, too. So I'm glad that you found it, like, universal. But I think, and I also think that that comes from, like, we all, regardless of um, ethnicity, we all feel distancing from history, whether we have strong roots to our past or not. That's another thing that's a very American experience um, in, in some ways that doesn't matter racially. We all sort of feel that diaspora. And even if you're of an indigenous stock, there's that sort of diaspora. There is no escaping that. Diaspora may be the one inclusive <laughs> American experience that we all feel to uh, a greater or lesser degree. I think that's right. And I hadn't thought about that before, but as soon as you said it, it seemed very, very true to me. Yeah, uh, I just thought of it right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happens yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, well. Hustle is divided into four parts. Yeah. And part three opens its motion and rest. Mm -hmm. And it's a prose poem. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's the only one in the book. Yep. And it begins in the first sentence, you say, stasis being the natural precursor of stagnation and death. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to talk about that. And I'd like you to talk about your decision to put it in prose form. Mm. Well, that comes from Simone Bay. I love the way she thinks. Having, you know, I wrote this poem when I was in Houston, and it was the first time I had really lived outside of San Diego. And I'd been in the Navy for 10 months, and I had been away but Houston was the first time that I had been on my own. When I started at the University of Houston for a PhD, I didn't have any funding from the University of Houston. And I had a ton of bills, and I had already maxed out my student loans, so I couldn't get student loans. And I was in a little one-bedroom apartment. I felt very alone. It was the first time that I had been away from my family. I didn't know <laughs> that I was like, in my early 30s, and I'm like, like, I didn't understand how much I needed my family. <laughs> and when I was, like, in this precarious position, like, I didn't know how I was going to make rent every month. And I was teaching at, you know, three classes at a community college. And then later on, I was teaching three at, at the University of Houston, doing anything else, taking three classes, and writing Hustle, like, furiously. I felt like, like, talk about motion and rest. Like, I, I was completely in turmoil, and I was completely in this tumultuous place emotionally and also, you know, psychologically. And it was very difficult for me. But I was also fixed because I had to be patient, because I had to, I had to like, continue to work hard. I had to continue to hone my craft. So when I read Simone Weil and she's talking about motion and rest, it really, really stuck with me. And so, like, you know, I just, I was like, man, I want to, to do something different. And I wrote this prose essay poem, and I thought, let me see if I can make this work in my book. And so that, that was part of the reason that I, also some of the poems, because it was written over such a large period, and I also, I wanted it to have breaks, because I also didn't feel like it was a, a continuous unit. 
and in that way, it's motion and rest as well. The whole yeah, oh yeah, nice collection of the book. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. And that's like why it starts the third, and that's like the sort of the second half of the book, and it like becomes something yeah, yeah, different. Yeah. Motion and rest signals a different approach to poetry. You know what it reminded me of? Mm. It reminded me of James Baldwin, the creative process. Mm -hmm. I, I love James Baldwin, so this is a true compliment mm -hmm. from the bottom of my heart. And he wrote, a society must assume that it's stable, but the artist must know and he must let us know that there is nothing stable under heaven. Yeah. And there was a sense when I read Motion and Rest, that quote just came to mind, and I felt like that's part of what you're doing with this book, too. Well, first of all, is there anyone better to quote than Baldwin? Well, maybe uh, Shakespeare. But right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> Shakespeare. Yeah, that that is very true. Uh, but but I, I feel like Baldwin particularly speaks to our moment. Shakespeare particularly speaks to all moments. Nice. And, anyways, wow. Yeah, that's that's huge. I really appreciate you saying that. No, not at all. You really look at masculinity and vulnerability in your work in in Hustle, mm -hmm. and that is rare anywhere. I think particularly in poetry. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how you got your hands around it and what you were trying to unpack there? I was raised in a very hyper machismo culture, and I was attracted to the aspects of strength that the patriarchy and that machismo culture really pushed in a sort of physical manner. What I didn't recognize is the sort of psychological and verbal poses that I would adopt via the patriarchy and, and, and hypermasculinity. When I began to be aware of them and I began to see myself and all of the mistakes I had made, sometimes being aware of them, sometimes not, I began to question who I was. And that's a hard place to be right when you think oh this is like who I am and this is what makes me me and then I began to question that and that's hard like I was like how can I express this in my poetry and I also feel like also this is like my gang experience helped form the way I see the world and that like in one day early in the afternoon I could see somebody beat someone up or that I could be I could beat someone up later on in the day I could get beat up and I saw people who would get life in prison for multiple murders, but I saw them hold their children. And I saw them mm. be completely kind with me. He's a murderer, you know what I mean? Like, you know that, but he was also a person. And later on in the book, there's Forgetting Willie James Jones. Well, I literally have it open on my lap because I was going to ask you to read that next, so it's a beautiful segue. Let's hear it, <laughs> okay. if you don't mind. Yeah. And this is um, also an, another uh, long uh, sequence. Forgetting Willie James Jones. One, it's not water to wine to swallow harm, though many of us have. And changing the name of Ozark Street to Willie Jones Street won't resuscitate, won't expose how the sun roars across rows of faces at the funeral for a 17-year-old boy, won't stop the double slapping of the screen door against a frame causing a grandmother by habit to yell out, Willie! It can't deafen the trophies in a dead teenager's room. That day in 94, I felt strong. I walked down the street with nickel bags of weed in the belt loops of my dickies and a bandana strung from my pocket. That's when I thought trouble could be run from, could be avoided by never sitting with your back to the door or near a window. I swore by long days and strutted along a rusted past, shook dice and smoked with the boys that posted on the corners and men cruising in coops, men built so big they took up both seats. I rode with them that summer. That was the season death walked alongside us all, wagging its haunches and twisting its collared neck at a bird glittering along a branch. Willie was shot in that heat, 
with a stolen pistol in the front yard of a party. It poked a hole no bigger than a pebble in his body. The shooters came from my high school. We smoked in the bungalow bathrooms during lunch. A few weeks before Willie got shot, Maurice had been killed. An awning after rain, Maurice and Willie sagged from the weight. Some say it is very better to be carried by six than judged by 12. Some say in the summer of 94 in southeast San Diego was just another summer. That is such a powerful poem. And, you know, in your old neighborhood, mm -hmm. there really wasn't a lot of chances for do-overs. <laughs> and not a lot of forgiveness. No, no not at all. Not at all. And I think... Um, I'm I'm always so mindful about if you want to talk about discrepancies in society, the people who really can be forgiven and the people who really can't be. I think that we're all very aware of the discrepancies of social economic discrepancies, the racial discrepancies that we impose as a society. However, the neighborhood imposes its own discrepancies. Like I came up through a lot of violence within my home, outside of my home. Hustle alludes to it. My second book talks about it. I was sexually abused. I saw a lot of violent stuff, you know, and I was lucky. Like I was lucky. I was lucky by the, my family that I had, the upbringing that I had, even the people that were around me. And I was lucky that in college that people saw through my rough exterior and they gave me room to grow. So many people I grew up with, they didn't, ha they didn't have that. Exactly. And I know that I've been lucky. I'm not, like, I don't in any way think that I'm special. I, I believe in my ability. I believe in my talent. I believe in all of these things. But there are so many people that, that had, they run circles around me with their, with their natural ability with language. And could out talk me and like they were really they were truly silver tongued but for whatever reason i was i've been very fortunate because we have very little yeah, yeah. time left and i could talk to you for a very <laughs> long time david i want to just turn to the nea for a moment yeah. and you got a fellowship a literature fellowship yeah. for the nea yeah. what did what did that mean for you man the nea for me was always one of those markers of success one of those markers that said you're a poet it wasn't until like I decided to get an MFA that I was like, I'm a poet. And, you know, I was collecting all of these things as reminders, as mementos that I was a poet. They were tattoos. My forms say poetic license. You mean like affirmations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a poet belt buckle. I had a poet coffee mug. I have multiple like poetry T-shirts. Those were one ways of like boosting my self-esteem to believe that I could do this. And the NEA was a marker for me. And that was something that I was like, I really want an NEA. And so when I was eligible for an NEA, I applied, man, as soon as I was eligible. And I was fortunate enough to get one. And like, man, to get an NEA just felt like I remember getting the phone call. And it felt like everything I had worked hard for was sort of validated and made me feel that I had made the right decisions. I was fortunate enough that like it happened in between my first and second book. And so I was like, man, this is, this is very cool. It gave you time to write. And then I, that's what I was going to get at next. And then, and the financial yeah. flexibility of, of, of getting money that like I knew I had, which was, it gave me for the first time in my life, like I wasn't worried about could I pay rent this month? Which is crazy for me. You know what I mean? Like as someone in their mid-30s to be like, do I get to pay rent this month? It was the first time in my whole life. That was the very first time that I was like, I felt like I had a little bit of um, breathing room, which was its own psychological boost as well as um, financial. I think that's a good place to end it, David, even though we did not talk about cooking at oh. all. Oh! I love to cook. I love to cook. Yes. 
Listen, I like to cook everything, but like Mexican yeah. food is my favorite. Like that's my favorite. And like I feel very in tune with the ancestors when I'm making tortillas. I feel like like when I write poems that I am part of a tradition. I believe this firmly that this is part of the reason why I write poetry. I believe strongly in an, in an aesthetic, in my aesthetic, because I believe that poetry is a tradition and that I'm writing with people through time that aren't like me, but some that are in various ways. But the one thing that connects us is poems and our fidelity to writing well-written poems. Whether I'm able to accomplish that, we'll see. But I feel the same way about cooking. So when I make tortillas or when I make carnitas or when I make enchiladas, I feel it's the same way. There's a tradition. There is a, a being in step with time that I am able to achieve in a very finite moment. You know, these are transient things. And like yeah. being able to cook and to work on recipes that my grandmother, she didn't pass them down to me. I just watched her. Oh, right. You know yeah. what I mean? And it was like there was a cookbook or something like that. No, 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 no. You know what I mean? I just watched her and then I would ask other people in the community. Right. I remember with my grandmother asking, well, how much flour? Enough. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I have zero recipes. Like everything is, you know, a rule of thumb, man. There's a real kinship for writing poems and cooking for me. And I also feel like it's one way that I'm able to share love. I mean, I love, I love to cook for my family and I love to cook for my friends. It, it gives me real pleasure. And in that way, I'm like, you know, I'm my grandmother. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh like, I think we all are. Right, yeah. you know. Well, David, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you for having me. That's poet David Tomas Martinez. His book, Hustle, has just been named a big read title. Hustle is published by Saraband Books. You can find out more about the big read at arts.gov. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. You can subscribe to Artworks wherever you get your podcasts. So please do, and leave us a rating on Apple. It helps people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. <laughs>